Hi, I'm uh, David Levine. I'm here with um, Susan Schneider. Dr. Schneider is a frequent speaker on the ethics and implications of artificial intelligence and has given a TED talk on the subject. She's the author of this book, which we're going to discuss today, called Artificial You, AI and the Future of the Mind. She brings these topics together in an accessible way, discussing the philosophical implications of AI and particularly the enterprise of mind design. Um, she's testified before Congress. She's been on the on PBS, the History Channel. She's been the keynote speaker at many AI conferences. And she's a consultant to NASA. And so I want to ask you, you got a you're so you you are your PhD is in philosophy, right? <laughs> you're you're a philosopher, correct? And you got a call from NASA. So I am the NASA chair this year. Okay. So I have a chair in actually it's kind of funny, it's in astrobiology. Um, so I'm the NASA chair at the Library of Congress and at NASA right now, based on um, some earlier work with NASA. I had a two-year project um, on artificial intelligence in space. Okay, so are you involved with um, their Mars, their Mars uh, program? No, uh, that would be super cool, but I don't think they're searching for alien intelligence out there. Where are they, where are they searching for alien intelligence? I don't think NASA is really involved in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. That's SETI, which okay. is a separate organization. But, um, you know, we have radio telescopes that are listening for um, alien signals. I'm not optimistic. I do think there may be aliens, though. <laughs> What does SETI what does SETI stand for? The search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And that, that was started by started by Doug Vadak and his group. Oh yeah, yeah, you know Doug. Um, right. So lots of people have been involved, and there's actually a SETI Institute in Mountain View. Uh, you know, you might have heard of Seth Shostak. He's been a very vocal SETI person, um, and there's also what's called active SETI, which is an attempt to um, argue that we should be sending messages to space. So calling attention to ourselves. And some people don't think that's a good idea, like Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates and people like that. Yeah, I actually argue against it too in my book. Um, I have a chapter on this stuff in Artificial You. Um, yeah, I think it's a bad idea. Of, of course, they could be listening anyway, but I mean, how embarrassing, right? I mean, they're going to get everything. They're going to get like our dumb TV. They're going to get the dark web. Uh, I don't know that we should call attention to ourselves. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna come and destroy us, basically? Like a Borg scenario? Yes. Um, yeah. So, okay, here's my take on that. All right. All this stuff, by the way, is very speculative. Uh, so let me just say... Oh, by the way, my dog is, I'm outside, as you can tell. My dog started up. I'm really sorry. Uh, Pixie, come on. I'm going to put her in the house. Um, okay. Wait a minute. Yeah. She's having a little, I have peacocks. So once the dog barks, the peacocks are going to go and it's going to be really loud. Pixie. Um, okay. So here's, here's, here's the deal with the outer space stuff. All right. So there's, um, a search for life in the sense of a search for microbial life. And, you know, lots of astrobiologists are interested in whether we might find the early signs of life out there. And NASA and researchers at various institutions have identified all these exoplanets, which are in principle, the kind of planets that would be ripe for life to begin at least according to our analysis. Um, of all those exoplanets, I do suspect that some of them may not just be habitable in principle, they could be inhabited. They could really have life on them. A small proportion of these, perhaps, could have life that grows, becomes complex, 
and even develops organisms with things like brains. And these creatures might navigate their environments to such an extent that they become technological. And my point in the book is that of the class of technological civilizations, this civilizations that survive their technological maturity, I think the most intelligent ones will be graduated, if you will, to synthetic life forms. They'll be highly intelligent, highly evolved AIs. So and so that was my project with NASA. And so you can see how that connects to the themes of the book, because I'm looking at issues involving the nature of mind. What is a mind? What is a self? What is consciousness? And talking about these issues in relation to artificial intelligence. In your book, you talk about the mind as a software. Right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think it's almost, it's not quite a paradigm in philosophy of mind, but it, it's a very popular view. The idea that the mind is something like a program. And it comes out of cognitive science, right? I mean, cognitive science suggests that the brain is computational. And a lot of people parse that as saying that the mind is computational. And they parse that as saying the mind is a program. And I actually argue the mind is not a program in the book, even though I do think the brain is computational. It can be described computationally. And I do think the computational paradigm in cognitive science, you know, the idea of explaining cognitive function in terms of computation is very successful, it's very useful. But I don't think that any of that entails that the mind is a program. And I actually think that viewing the mind as a program is somewhat fruitless philosophically. That's what I argue. So, I, so when I read the book, I think you're talking about what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be conscious? And, um, and, and also, how does artificial intelligence help us or enhance it? Um, and you talk about that, that there's a goal of, like, there's a goal to make artificial intelligence conscious as opposed to being a zombie. And um, which means that it doesn't really, you know, it, it doesn't really have a, a, a subjective experience. Um, so, um, so what is it? What is enhanced artificial intelligence, and why is that important? What's a what artificial intelligence? Enhanced. Enhanced. Yes. Sorry. Okay. All right. So, let's see. So, I'm not sure AI will be conscious. Okay. Um, I take a wait and see approach, and I offer several arguments suggesting that there are a lot of considerations uh, saying that AIs may not be conscious as they are developed on Earth, okay? Um, I also talk about how humans might enhance their intelligence using AI. And half of the book is on that. And I express a lot of worries about that, not, not from the vantage point of uh, being a... Um, Luddite or anything. I mean, hey, if we can live longer and be smarter, all the power to us. I think that's a lovely goal. But I have philosophical worries about what it all means and that maybe we won't even get to that point if we try. Like, it may not be possible to do too much of that AI enhancement. So I'm not sure which of these were you asking about. She talked about enhancement, but you're talking about machine consciousness. So... I mean, someone, I can elaborate on either one. Uh, so, so someone, in the, okay, so you can put a uh, question in the Q&A box. So someone asked me, what is consciousness? Oh, gosh, good question. Okay. So consciousness is the felt quality of experience. So throughout your waking life and even when you're dreaming, it feels like something to be you, right? So when you like smell the aroma of your espresso shot, um, or you feel the sunlight on your face, you're having conscious experience, or when you have a bad headache. 
consciousness is what makes life so wonderful and it also is what makes life so crappy sometimes, right? And that's why we think suffering is bad. So consciousness is sort of, I think, one of the biggest wonders of the universe. Why are we conscious? And you also talk about that, you know, from, from Descartes to Buddha, they have, they have very different views of what, what consciousness is. Yeah. Um, so consciousness is intimately connected to the nature of the self, right? If you ask yourself, what am I? I mean, being a conscious being is essential to you. I mean, if you were not conscious at all, if you were no longer capable of being conscious, then you would have lost something really, really important. So when thinking about the nature of the self or person, uh, different philosophers have had different approaches. So Descartes, I think, felt that that conscious feeling was essential to the nature of the self. Now, a lot of people reject the idea, the very idea of the self, okay? Without necessarily rejecting consciousness, but people like Derek Parfit, for example, who's a contemporary philosopher, um, and arguably the Buddha, had a no self view. So they thought that the self was just an illusion. As Friedrich Nietzsche put it, the I is a grammatical fiction, right? And so what that means, here's the deep issue here, is that there may be a conscious being at every instant, okay? But from moment to moment, do we truly survive? Is there anything like a persisting self that, say, exists from one moment to the next? And a respectable answer is that maybe there isn't. So, so we're, we're different selves all the time? Well, one way to look at it is that way, that there's always a self here, but it's different from instant to instant. But I think the deeper way, and I think the intention of the no self view is that there's really no such thing as a self at all. The self is an illusion. So, you know, in Hume's, you know, uh, words, you know, we're like bundles of impressions, but there's no underlying substance. So, you know, these are the kind of background philosophical views that I discuss in a little more detail in the book. Um, and I think it's important to think about consciousness and the self because um, as we move forward in the age of AI, if we start creating intelligent robots, we're gonna wanna know if they're conscious or if they're selves. It makes a difference ethically speaking. And we're also going to want to know <laughs> if we become cyborgs, if we radically enhance our brains, will we continue to exist? Or will we have been, been transformed to such a point that we're no longer the person we were before? So how does artificial intelligence help us and how, how does it hurt us? Well, AI is obviously, a transformative technology. Um, and, you know, there are so many domains right now that, you know, we're looking at ethically speaking and asking how should this domain be developed? So one example would be AI-based autonomous weapons. What should the role of AI be in defense? Should we um, have the robotization of the military? Um, how should humans be in the chain of command? And that's just the warfare area, okay? But think about the more everyday area of our lives. Um, think about even a mortgage application that is run by a deep learning system that is pulling data in that could be implicitly biased and then make decisions that 
discriminate against certain groups of people. That's happened, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of worry about algorithmic discrimination. Um, I work with Congress. That's part of my role in Washington, D.C. at the Library of Congress. So um, I'm kind of involved with some of the activities on the Hill now, and there's a lot of concern about algorithmic discrimination. Other issues that are really important, I mean, you know, how should we develop AI technology? I mean, you know, there's almost like an implicit AI war with China right now, like we need to keep up, if you will. That's the perception of a lot of people in Washington. A lot there's of, so many issues. Yeah, there's a lot of fear. Um, Ch Chinese students who come over here are looked upon as possible spies, and uh, they're very concerned about that. Um, so, okay, so someone asked a question. So if I'm feeling, the, the pain when I'm feeling, when my finger is prick means that it's not myself that is feeling pain. So if, so if someone stabs me in the arm, that's, I'm not feeling that? Look, I, I hear you. I mean, I think that the no self view Right. is somewhat counterintuitive, right? On the other hand, you know, it could be that the self is just something that the brain is doing, if you will. Um, it's like we have this implicit self-concept designed to keep us alive, and it's intimately connected to our sense of our bodily boundaries. You can see it throughout the animal kingdom. And some people claim that consciousness could exist without a self and that a richer way to look at reality is to let that idea of a self go and just see consciousness all around us. Okay. So, okay. So we're all, I, I have an, I have an Amazon echo. So that's, so that's, that's very primitive, but there's like the, the, the um, like the, the Jeopardy winners, you know, the computers have, have beaten Jeopardy and, and the, the Go, you know, and chess, and then the Go, they built, they built, the Deep Mind built a machine that built the, beat the Go Master, which they said couldn't be done. And um, but these are, but these are really very, still very primitive, aren't they? As, as to what you're talking about. Like if you said, yeah. you know. and it's scary how much they can do, given how primitive they are. That I find incredibly weird. Um, so we already have the world go champion, the world chess champion, the world jeopardy champion. Now, of course, that's just the domain of games, you might say, mm -hmm. but I think there's something deep going on here, actually. Um, I think that AIs are better pattern recognizers than we are. So they're really good at pattern recognition, especially these deep learning systems. And the vast nature of their databases and the high efficiency, like neurons aren't that efficient, indicates to me that decades from now, AIs will be smarter than us in many, many more respects. So you talk about a lot about movies, like the movie Her you talk about, where a man falls in love with his robot, robot and his voice and stuff. And, um, and then he's stunned to learn that, well, I guess everyone's seen, he's stunned to learn that she said she's been speaking to like 10,000 people like this. Oh, I know, right? You know, and uh, he's very hurt. Very low systems. He's on him, um, Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I know that people, people, ha people are having relationships with their machines and things. Um, do, are these bad things, good things, or? There's already some real weird shit going on, right? Like no. those Japanese androids. Right. Whoa. I mean, if the listeners Google uh, Japanese androids, you could see that they're very lifelike. And, you know, a lot of times they're like female and you're kind of wondering, right? Uh, you know, people will be in relationships with AIs. Absolutely. And that's why I think it's important that we ask these philosophical questions, right? So... Um, one of the things that the book considers is 
will AI be conscious? So, you know, remember I said consciousness is the felt quality of experience. So imagine you're in a relationship with somebody or something. It's an AI, it looks human, very smart and impressive, uh, lots of social intelligence, you know, never forgets anything you suggest. <laughs> so what if it's not conscious? What if it doesn't feel like anything to be it? Isn't that kind of creepy? I mean, maybe some people won't care, but I think a lot of people will. There's a TV show called The Humans, I, I believe. Oh yeah, that was good. With William Hurt, and he had a robot that was malfunctioning, but he didn't want to, he didn't want to replace because he liked it. You know, he, he liked the quirkiness of its person. Oh yeah, he liked her a little too much, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that kind of stuff will happen. Um, I mean, I don't know why people want human looking AIs. Like my own stick, you know, is they shouldn't look like us if you want them to work for us because when we see something that looks human, we are gonna impute our ethical views, you know, on it. We're treating it as if it's a human. It's really easy to do, right? Or even if it looks like, you know, a puppy, you're gonna think it's sentient. Well, in the show, I don't really think it's that clear that they will be. I think we have to run tests. I've been working on tests for machine consciousness. And I also just think it's creepy. I mean, why do we want to create another kind of class of beings to take care of when we don't even take care of the people on the planet as it is? Right. Well, you know? In the TV show, one of the women get, she gets a maid who's a robot who never gets tired, never, never gets bothered by the children, you know, doesn't need to sleep. And she gets jealous that, uh, you know, the kid, and actually they did a poll that the, the TV audience liked the robots and better than they liked the people. And um, I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, uh, and, you know, if you consider um, all the researchers working on social intelligence, they can find out what it is that humans like and right. just build it into the robots eventually so that the robots will say the right thing, the right thing. I mean, they'll have more efficacy getting along than we will. They're never, they're or maybe never, we'll have to enhance to keep up with the AIs. I mean- They never scold you. Alexa always says, have a good day, good morning, how are you? It's very, very polite to me. So. Yeah, so I don't have any of that crap in my house because I don't want to feed information to the data economy. Okay. And hopefully we'll get a handle on data privacy before all these little robots are walking around our house. Or else they're just going to sell information about us to the highest bidder. Okay, so in the, in the book you talk about Elon Musk and is a transhuman. And they said, and they said, you feel you are a transhuman. So what is a transhuman? I was a transhumanist when I was in high school and graduate school. And I guess I still am. So transhumanism is a social, cultural, and philosophical movement okay. that talks about the development of the human species. And it's very visionary. It suggests that we should use science and technology to establish radical longevity and radical intelligence. And you see people like Ray Kurzweil. You know, over the years, he's written some really fun books, books that inspired me. Uh, like you what? know, Singularity is Near, The Age of Intelligent Machines. Right. And I think a lot of people were reading him and they were saying, hey, yeah, like computation is going to free us. You know, it's sort of like an atheist techno heaven, right? A technotopia where you could use brain enhancements and you could even upload to the cloud and you could in principle live forever, at least until the heat death of the universe. Well, I've never, seen, I've never seen a movie where, you know, robots or artificial intelligence is portrayed. Somehow, you know, they, they always turn on us or people from another world come here, or there's viruses that, that you know, get, you know, that, um, it, it always seems the future is very bleak, that uh, all, the, all these things that we, we think are gonna help us actually don't. And I've never seen a film about the future which shows it, you know, like, 
know, any of the films, Terminator or... I know, right? All these films, yeah. I know, and I would love some visions of the future in science fiction that weren't dystopian. I think one problem is it's really hard to figure out what a really technologically advanced civilization looks like, you mm -hmm. know, which is one of the reasons I think it's hard to find aliens that are smarter than us. So that might be part of the problem. I mean, you see these very vague depictions, like in that film AI, at the very end, there's a super intelligent species and they're kind of in the background. They're doing, you know, magical things, but we don't understand it. There was also a theory that we we're actually living in a little bubble and that, um, that they're, they're human beings, they're superior alien forces just have captured, captured us and are watching us like, like in a crystal ball or something. Like a zoo? Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, we could be in a computer simulation. I mean, a lot of people have talked about that. We could also be in a kind of sentience playpen in a larger universe. Uh, maybe that's why we haven't found E.T. yet. <laughs> maybe they don't want us to find anyone because we're part of some sort of science experiment in a Department of Human Studies over at some planet near Alpha Centauri. I don't think that's going to be the case. And I'm not sure we'll be in a sim either. Although, you know, the sim hypothesis is really challenging and really interesting. Um, you know, if you want, I can talk about that a little. That's been in the news a lot. Science writers might enjoy that. Go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. What is it? Okay. So it's the idea that everything is basically a giant computer simulation, sort of like an Uber holodeck. Okay. So I think there's a really good paper on this by Nick Bostrom. Um, if you Google Nick Bostrom and you Google Chronicle of Higher Education, there's a really short write-up in the Chronicle of Higher Education that is great. Super clear. So the idea, here's the argument. The argument is that um, some civilizations will be interested in running simula simulations of Earth. Okay? That's like a premise. I'm trying to remember everything, but this, this next premise would be something like there are lots more uh, simulated Earths than real Earths. Okay? And then the conclusion, I have a feeling I'm forgetting a premise, I'm sorry. The conclusion is that we are in a simulation. Now the reasoning is this, okay, suppose that some civilizations like to run simulations for whatever reason, like maybe there's a Department of Human Studies, or maybe as in the Matrix, it's like Earthlings doing it, and we're actually living in the past right now, and they're in the future, and they're simulating us in sort of the world of 2020, okay? Um, but anyway, suppose there are like three civilizations doing that, and that it's, you know, technologically possible to run simulations like this. That, you know, computation really gets that sophisticated. Well, if that's the case, then the chances are three to one that we are in fact in a simulation. So there's only one real world, but there'll be three simulated worlds. And so then it's more likely than not. Well, that's a skeletal version of the argument. But I mean, it's been, it's a well-respected idea, and it's difficult to figure out how you could actually experiment. I mean, how would you really find out you were in a simulation, or how would you really find out you're not? And now what, it's time for a happy hour. What does it mean if you were? So what does it mean if, I, if I'm living in a simulation? Yeah. Um, so philosophers have thought about that issue. Um, there have been some really cool papers on it. Like there was a paper by Jim Pryor on this topic, like what would it matter if you're in a computer simulation? And you might think, I mean, this is how I feel. I'll tell you how I feel. I'd be like, if someone told me you're in a simulation, first of all, I'd be like, great. Someone could like flick a switch and we're doomed. Like they could just shut us down, right? right? I mean, for all we know, we could have been shut down constantly, right? 
like some teenager turns us on in their timeline at 5 p.m. every night, turns us off at 6 when he's done with this video game and he built us some like super intelligent teenager. Well, I just worry that somebody is going to be finicky and just be like, you know what? Fuck those humans. They're boring. I mean, we're not that exciting. We fight all the time. And so one reaction would be like, try to make the world interesting for the super intelligent beings. I don't really know how to do that because they're super intelligent. So, but um, you might also say, you know what? I'm just going to assume that the timeline of the universe is going to play out like we have until big crunch or whatever the end of space time as we know it because after all if, if a civilization can create this maybe they have something like a prime directive and they can't turn it off because we're sentient <laughs> let's keep, let's assume that well if that's the case you might say well then who gives a sh right but i do i would care really deeply i'll tell you because it bugs me to be an isolated pocket of the universe, like with the laws different. Like everything we know is like a story that's been written by some other civilization and ultimate reality, right? Reality outside of the simulation is not accessible to us. And that would bug me out. Of course, maybe the civilization that built us is in a simulation too. Maybe it's, Simulations all the way down. Okay. Well, thanks for clearing that up. But, uh, okay. Oh, no I, problem. Um, I can tell you how to test for it, though I have a little suggestion. Okay, sure. You hear it? Yeah. I've been meaning to um, hit up a millionaire because they're all worried about this stuff, or the billionaires, you know, they're worried that we're in a sim. And I can tell you right now, there's one way to find out if we're not, okay? Test machine consciousness. And if it turns out that no matter how hard we try, we can't build conscious machines, then I think it looks like we may not be in a simulation because machines can't be conscious. Because if we're in a sim, we would be machines. We'd be conscious machines. We'd be like avatars in a video game. Right, because we can tell introspectively that we're conscious beings. It feels like something to be us. If AI can't be conscious, it can't feel like anything to be an avatar, even in an Uber holodeck, right? Okay. So there you go. So you talk about that, that um, in terms of for NASA, the AIs would be better astronauts than human beings. And I can understand that, that they're not going to tire. They probably won't make mistakes. But um, they may not be able to gain, you know, they may not be able to express poetically what they're seeing. What's it, why, are, why are AIs better astronauts? Yeah, so this is a dicey issue because we love it emotionally when we put people in space right like you remember a few weeks ago the spacex nasa collaborative launch yeah. i was i mean right in the middle of a pandemic and race riots and you know all this stuff it was so refreshing to see us launching successfully like i was sitting there crying that's just how i am you know like when someone wins a gold medal in the olympics i cry i get happy for them i mean it's just wonderful so i think people want to see humans in space and i know that's one of the issues with congress like if you're trying to drum up money for a space mission uh you know the idea of putting a human in space is very attractive right all that being said though there's also data suggesting that we don't do that well in space i mean you put us in there for a year you come back you know your body's really been impacted I mean, we saw that uh, when we put, we had one identical twin on Earth and one in space, right? And they were able to collect the biometric data and just look at how the person did in space. I don't think in the next 40 years, 
we're going to want to do a very, very sophisticated mission using the latest AI technology because it could break. But eventually, when it becomes durable, when we're very confident in it, when there are lots of backups, I think we could go really far with AI in space. Yeah. So last summer was the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. And I, saw, I got to see Michael Collins speak about it and Buzz Aldrin. And they all said that, that you know, that, that it, was, it was a very unifying um, time for mankind because they said, we did it. You know, we got, we got a human being on space. And they didn't, they didn't say it was an American, didn't say. Right. You know, that it was very, very unifying. And astronauts also talked about the overview effect where they, where they, can, where they see the earth. And they, and they say, why are we fighting? It's, a, it's such a beautiful planet. Yeah. And, um, and I wonder if that's gonna be lost if we have robots. You know, I mean, because they, they don't, robots don't have the same value system we have. Yeah, and part of the beauty of space exploration is the astronaut communicating the bewilderment yeah. and seeing the pale blue dot. Yeah, I mean, on the other hand, I think somebody should write a good Oculus game where you're out there in space. Why doesn't someone do that? Because having a VR experience like that yourself can be an amazing experience. Maybe that's how in the future we'll experience space. It won't be through sending people up there, but by simulating what it would be like. I don't know. Actually, you know what? Though, there'll be people who pay money to go into space. I know. I mean, that's already starting. So I think there are people who've at least signed up for that. I mean, there'll be space tourism, but I mean, from the vantage point of exploration, um, you know, that's, that's a way that, like, if you need to get to Alpha Centauri, you don't, you don't want to send a human. No. Uh, they asked David Bowe if he ever, if he ever wanted to go into space, and he said, absolutely not. No, it doesn't even like to fly. So here, here's a question. Um, you mentioned the sort of meddling of humans and, and technology humans becoming more machines or cyborgs. I've read that, for example, the way we use Google and search has changed how humans use memory. You feel this over-reliance on technology and in turn the hope for being able to rely on artificial intelligence can potentially create people who are not as adaptable to environments, situations without technology. So basically, the more we Google, the more we don't have to remember things. So. Um, yeah, I mean, is that true? Is, I mean, is that what's happening psychologically? Because I don't know the data. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, is it making us dumber? I know that we're reading less. That worries me because I think reading is correlated with success, right? At the education, like, I mean, you as a parent, right? I mean, you're supposed to get your child to read a lot. Well, now adults aren't reading as much and kids aren't reading as much. That's scary. Now, I don't know if it's messing up our memories. Well, I don't know. If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, I've heard said, that. Someone said you're at dinner and you're thinking about an actor you can't think of, and someone said, oh, I'll just Google it. You know, they can no, I love it. that. Yeah. All right, I mean, I love the information at your fingertips thing. I just think it's so fun. It's so great to be informed. It used to frustrate me as a kid having unanswered questions. Of course, computers can't answer the big questions, right? They, they, they can't tell us why we're here, whether there's a God, um, if there's a persisting self. So here's, another, here's another question. It took humans to teach AI pattern recognition. Could AI teach us to be better at pattern, rec at, at pattern recognition as well as other things? So could we learn from artificial intelligence? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it could, it could be, I mean, human machine collaboration is a really interesting issue. Um, it could be that we could get some sort of feedback that helps us to be better at certain tasks, right? Um, on a more radical level, it could be that we add microchips to the brain. That's a scenario I consider a lot in the book 
to make ourselves smarter. Although I have a lot of worries about that. Um, I also think beyond just the pattern recognition issue, um, AI could help us to get rid of cognitive biases if, if done right. I mean, so suppose I'm a HR employee and I'm supposed to be hiring people, but I keep hiring, you know, suburban blonde females, you know, <laughs> the AIs are going to be like, yeah, you're hiring your college friends or whatever. So it could be good. It could be a checks and balance situation. On the other hand, I don't know how many of you have heard of these nightmare scenarios. There's already these HR programs that implicitly discriminate because they actually pull in social biases. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully though over the years we'll get it right. Like that's my, you know, my hope. And we could actually see the opposite of what we see today. What we're seeing today is algorithmic discrimination, but it could be that AI actually helps us to be less biased ourselves eventually. I want to yeah. talk yeah, I want to talk about um, AI and medicine. And I know that some some places, I know Duke University said that AIs can, you know, they, a human always has to make the final decision. It's kind of like, you know, the classic, you know, the classic, like, you know, our car, cars are automatic and they, have, they, they come on 10 people and, and they have, you don't want the machine to decide, do you kill yourself or do you kill 10 people? Um, and also, if, if you're looking at a, um, you know, you don't want someone to say, no, this person is too old to get a transplant. You don't want the AI to make the final decision. And do you, do you agree with that? An AI making a final decision? About whether or not to do, to do, to, to, to save someone's lives or to do yeah. what they're um, I think people feel that way. Um, yeah. I think people feel that, first of all, AI has to be transparent. So the user of the system has to understand the system's reasoning. Mm -hmm. And that's essential for understanding whether we can trust the AI and also for accountability, whether this be the domain of medicine or the domain of warfare. Um, so there's a lot of concern right now about the black box issue. Um, which is a problem that emerges for deep learning systems. So, you know, these deep learning systems, even today, are very hard to figure out. Um, so, you know, you have these multi-layered kind of networks where information propagates through the layers in a way that gets complex very quickly. And they're data-driven systems, so there's no explicit program that's written by a programmer at the beginning that remains unchanged. As you program the data in, the program just is the conglomeration of data and the layers of the network and the weights and whatnot. All this means that it's really hard to tell why a machine does what it does, even now. And for this reason, there's been a lot of concern um, like in the U.S., in the U.K., and elsewhere, about making sure that AI systems are transparent. So until we can get that right, we have to be very, very careful. Well, didn't Isaac Asimov create laws for robots? Yeah, but he did that to make a point, right? right. I mean, the laws didn't work, and that was his point, to set up fun short stories showing how paradoxical those three laws were together. It's super hard to program ethical principles into an AI for a number of reasons. And so there's a whole sort of AI ethics industry right now. Uh, a lot of people are worried that, about AI safety Especially since, I mean, it was several years ago, Nick Bostrom wrote a book called Super Intelligence, became a New York Times bestseller. He was a philosopher. He was surprised. He was like, whoa. <laughs> um, but, you know, 
everybody took it really seriously. And um, people like Bill Gates and um, Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, all talked about it a lot. And as a result, there's been a lot of money invested in AI safety to try to figure out what sort of ethical principles we can program in or, you know, how to get around the need to program the principles in early to make sure that the AI still is human friendly. So Stuart Russell has a new book, which I highly recommend okay. on this topic called Human Compatible. Really nice book. We just did an event together recently. So um, I know in the 1980s, I think it was, that there was a, the Russians thought there was a nuclear attack. They got all the signs, but one guy said no. He said, one, there was one person who said no, this is not real. Yes. And yeah. And didn't he just die? Yeah, he did. No, isn't that, he, he did. Yeah. Was, and yeah. Talk, I mean, he did, he did us all a favor because we're still alive. But I mean, is that, um, that's the fear of artificial intelligence, right? That's, that there's going to be a big. It and that's why human machine interaction is a big issue. I mean, because as we move into the future, we can't just say, sadly, that humans can do it all. Because to detect attacks, we're going to need our AI devices. So right. they're going to be, there's going to be things happening so quick that the human perceptual system will not have time to react. Okay. So that's why trust is so important with these AI systems. And then there's got to be a way that humans can stay in the loop. And that's the problem because with autonomous weapons, it's very reasonable to want, I, I mean, to oppose autonomous weapons by asking that a human be in the loop. It's a tricky, muddled issue, right? Because you may not be able to stay safe doing that. So my suggestion is let's enhance humans, at least some humans, and keep them in the loop of these AI systems so the AIs can detect um the missiles that are coming so quickly and recognize patterns the world i mean the world of warfare is it's a, a lot of tough ethical decisions need to be made all right i'm kind of intrigued because i've, I've written about alzheimer's disease and there's a move to kind of you could repair brains through artificial intelligence and replace them how, how does that work I hope it works really well eventually because mm -hmm. I'm currently killing brain cells during happy hour. Okay. Um, yeah, so Ted Berger has a super project to uh, create an artificial hippocampus. So it's the hippocampus that encodes new memories. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, there are famous cases like HM and Clive Waring, who is still alive in England right now who, you know, these are people who uh, were normal functioning adults. Uh, Wearing is a famous composer, actually. And they had something happen to their hippocampus and they were unable to encode new memories. And so Berger for about 15 years has been working on an artificial hippocampus. And it is now in phase two or three clinical trials in humans. Um, so he's already done it in chimps. He called it the chimpocampus. Isn't that funny? Yeah. The chimpocampus. They would, re they would replace your hippocampus or just part of it or what? Um, you know, I don't know. I should read that. I should read his papers in depth because there are different areas of the hippocampus, right? And they encode different algorithms. It, they're actually fairly well understood. That part of the brain is... Um, mm in better shape than the rest of the brain in terms of our understanding of it. You know, it's like, you know, you could start to reverse engineer a lot of the hippocampus, but the thing is that algorithm that you're using is only a pale version of the real thing. It's like, think of um, one of the jokes about being in a simulation is you don't want to be in a, low fidelity version of it, 
right? I hope that's not us. We'll never know. But I mean, similarly, these brain chips that are under development today, they're super low fidelity because A, we don't know very much about the brain and B, our technology is still, it's like, you know, kindergarten. But the cool thing is that even that being said, there's been success with the artificial hippocampus. Um, it's still external to the brain though. I mean, that's the problem, Find, getting it implanted into the brain. That, that's about, I think that's about 10 years away. All right, so I have, another, I have another question. Do you think any of the common fears about artificial intelligence have actually come true? I think they're coming true. I mean. Okay, so what are, what are, the, fear, what are, what are the fears that are coming true? Well, I mean, I read a lot of science fiction. Okay. You know, like, when I was in grad school, I did this anthology called Science Fiction and Philosophy, just based on a class I was teaching. Mm -hmm. I was reading a lot of it. Um, I mean, I don't even know where to start, right? I mean, you know, one of my favorite writers um, was Isaac Asimov and, you know, the iRobot stories. Um, I mean, I could totally see that happening. And you see the androids being built right now in Japan. They're so human-like. Um, so, you know, that's weird. I mean, there's also in a, on a more visionary level, there are these cases of like in science fiction of AI supervisory systems that hang around until the heat death of the universe, taking care of sentient beings. And I just got back from a workshop on a global AI supervisory system. So again, the question is, have anything we, that people are worrying about, like a machine made, made, a, made a decision that was a mistake, has that, has that happened yet? Or is there too much, is there too much um, supervision by humans still? Machines messed up constantly. I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, just try to load windows. Okay. All right. I mean, every time I can't do something on the computer, I rejoice because that means it's going to be a long time before that creates super intelligence. We're going to need it to figure out how to do it safely. So, do you feel that with all, you know, the, like, so you Google something and then like two minutes later you see an ad on Facebook for the same product. Do you, do you feel that way? Do you feel that um, we're giving up our privacy too much? Yes. Um, and I worry when you extrapolate from these trends, right? Because we're all fed up. I mean, we all feel like it's creepy. Right. Um, and, you know, gee, how many of us have time? I mean, even if we're home 24-7 in this pandemic, to sit around reading these user agreements, which are designed to be so opaque and lengthy that you just click yes, right? I mean, we're fed up. I mean, companies like Cambridge Analytica and Facebook are just mining our data and selling it to the highest bidder. And I think it's messing up the development of artificial intelligence. It's messing it up because, you know, think about these COVID apps. I mean, how many people are gonna wanna use them now after you know, after Cambridge Analytica, it messes up trust, right? Sure. So, you know, if we're going to trust AI, these companies have to behave respect responsibly. And, you know, Congress, I work with them, as I mentioned, you know, they care a lot about this and they want to enact legislation. I mean, California has some really strict legislation, good for them, because it put the uh, impetus on Congress because now the Republicans want nationwide legislation, you see, because they don't want it to be stringent like California. So, I mean, there are things that are happening right now, even in the U.S., which is behind Europe in that area. So, uh, you know, we'll see. But, oh, what, what I was going to say is if we don't get this right, uh, you know, I just, uh, I worry that when AI goes inside the head, 
it's going to be um, our thoughts being sold to the highest bidder, not our data. I mean, the new data, the ultimate form of data will be our innermost thoughts. Okay. If we become cyborgs. And I mean, that's totally science fiction-y. Um, there's a whole genre of science fiction that depicts these scenarios called um, cyberpunk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, how about that? I mean, like Gibson, Rudy Rucker. So in the movie 2001, <clears throat> everybody remembers the computer. I mean, they probably don't remember the actors, but the computer is... The computer was spy. They thought they thought they were having privacy, and the computer was spying on them. And they, and Hal says, "I'm sorry, Dave, but I have to kill you." You know, and, um, and I love it. But, but, and that, that really freaked people out. You know. So um, anyway, so we can. I named my car after Hal. Uh -huh. I have a Tesla. I named it Hal. My garage door I called Pod Bay door. I get to my door. Here's, here's oh. Here's Susan's book, so we're going to end in a few minutes. And um, how do I, how, usually at our book events, we have the author there in person and we sell books, so we can't do that. So where can, they can go to Amazon to buy your book. That's the best, where, where else can they buy, where can people buy your book? Yeah, you could go to Amazon. Okay. Uh, it's, okay, I, I highly recommend it. It's very readable, it's understandable, it's a lot of fun. So I want to thank Dr. Schneider for spending an hour with us. She's in her beautiful home in Pennsylvania. I'm in a little apartment in Manhattan. And um, I want to thank um, Joe Bonner, who's my co-chair at Science Writers in New York, for making this possible by doing all the technology. And Joe, can you, um, I can't turn off the recording. So if you can do that, we'll say goodbye. So. Thank you for having me. And everybody, thank you very much for attending, um, especially on such a pretty day today. Okay. Thank you, and uh, we'll buy your book. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.